The Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of money that the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So not necessarily thinking of the story from today's gospel, but in general, how do you picture Jesus? Take a few seconds and just picture what Jesus looks like in your mind. We'll get back to this in a few minutes. This story of Jesus clearing the temple is pretty familiar, but when I realized this was the reading for today, the day I happened to volunteer to cover the sermon for Pastor Neil, I had to do some more research. So if you don't like the sermon, it's not his fault I wrote it. So just, we'll get that out of the way. And Steve's probably got me on the clock already, so we'll find out at the end. So a version of this story of Jesus clearing the temple is in all four Gospels. So interestingly, John, the book we read from today, is the only one that tells this story early on. The other gospel writers tell of Jesus clearing the temple soon before his crucifixion. Matthew, Mark, and Luke specifically indicate that the leaders began plotting how to kill Jesus after this whole temple clearing incident. Is that because it happened more than once? I mean, did Jesus have to clear the temple more than once? Or did John just choose to tell it earlier? Who knows? But we should recognize there are only a limited number of stories, maybe 10, 12, 18, that appear in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So clearly, this was a memorable event that warranted documenting, and we probably should pay attention and try to learn something from it. Now, the book of John tells us that Jesus goes to Jerusalem at the time of the annual Passover celebration. Passover itself was just one day, but they had a week-long festival And it was all to remember the freeing of the Jews from their slavery in Egypt. During this yearly celebration, every Jew, or at least every Jewish male, was expected to make the pilgrimage from wherever they lived and go to Jerusalem to partake in this festival. They were to offer their sacrifice, like Rebecca told the children, for their sins, and they had to worship in the temple. The population of Jerusalem, I read somewhere, was around 50,000, but during this festival, it increased to maybe 180,000. So it was a big deal, and there would have been people everywhere. Think donkey gridlock. Okay, but let's think about it even further. The Jews were traveling from all over. They were required to bring a sacrifice for their sins that they would offer at the temple. The sacrifices had to be living animals, and they had to be unblemished and in perfect condition. And of course, the temple authorities got to decide whether their sacrifice was good enough or not. So it would have been difficult to keep these animals in perfect condition while traveling. So these genius entrepreneurs decided to sell oxen, sheep, doves, cattle right there in the temple. That way the travelers could just purchase the sacrifice when they got there. It's like when we go to the beach and we don't get groceries till we get there, right? But better yet, their sacrifice was guaranteed to be acceptable to the temple authorities if they were purchased on temple grounds. Sounds a little shady. These folks selling animal sacrifices had a flourishing business this time of year. And of course, they could mark up the prices. They could charge a lot more for the guaranteed, appropriate sacrificial animals than the animal would have cost for these folks elsewhere. But then these foreign travelers also had to pay a temple tax. They couldn't pay it with their native money. They had to get their money exchanged when they got to Jerusalem. And once again, for convenience, the money changers set up booths at the temple. And once again, they would charge higher than normal rates, right? Everybody's got to get their cut from these travelers, taking full advantage of those who had come simply to worship. 
The leaders of the church seemed to rationalize this. This overcharging was a convenience. It was a moneymaker for temple upkeep, right? They said it was okay. The leaders did not seem to mind that these businesses, yes, while making money, also made it difficult for people to do the very thing they came there to do, and that was to worship. Enter Jesus. We can tell by his response he's not happy, and it's a big deal. He does not ask them nicely to move their oxen selling to another location. He does not tell a simple parable to teach them not to make a greedy profit profit from diligent worshipers. Nope. He made a whip. He chased out the animals. He scattered the coins and overturned their tables. He told them sternly and boldly, get out. He proclaimed they dare not turn his father's house into a shopping mall. Yep, he's angry. But did Jesus sin here? No. The people misusing God's temple enraged him. Disturbance of worship made him angry. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. Jesus is angry about injustice, this taking advantage of these travelers, and these other folks sin. And from the description we have here, he made no effort to hide his anger. He was very direct. Sarah, or Sarah. <laughs> he made his point quite clearly. So at the beginning, when I asked you to picture Jesus, did anybody picture angry Jesus? No. Right? And, and maybe it really doesn't matter what Jesus looks like, right? But in general, outside the context of this story, I certainly don't picture angry Jesus. But then maybe it's okay to be reminded that Jesus was no make-nice pushover. Jesus had a human side in addition to his divides, divine nature. And Jesus was and is no wimp. Years ago, late at night, I worked crazy hours, and I worked at a, a long-term care pharmacy down in Covington, Ohio. And as I was driving home, I was listening to something on the radio, and I remember some guy saying, Jesus is no wimp. I don't remember anything else that this sermon or this discussion was about, but that tagline has kind of stuck with me. And every once in a while, I think about that. Jesus is no wimp. And I think this is important because maybe sometimes we put Jesus in this little nice box, right? Jesus is a nice guy. He's all loving and all giving and all forgiving. He was the humble son of a carpenter. He washed his friend's dirty feet and told stories with a lesson. He meekly cuddled up with lambs, right? Oh, Jesus, such a nice guy. But sometimes I think our culture has somehow wimpified him. And when we're facing a dark and scary world, maybe it comes hard to believe that this mellow Jesus can possibly combat the evil we see in our world. Maybe we come to church on Sundays and think about this nice guy, Jesus, and we pray to a far-off God who once upon a time sent forth the Ten Commandments that we read about in the first reading. But then we leave church and return to our real world, a world that's tough, a world in which nightly news can bring us near tears or have us losing sleep over the future. How can our culture's wimpified Jesus face or fix any of that? The good news is Jesus is no wimp. Don't get me wrong, Jesus was and is ever loving and ever forgiving. He was the humble son of a carpenter. He did wash the feet of his apostles, and he did tell parables. But he was not and is not a pushover. The gospel today reminds us of that. Everything about his response to the merchants in the temple is strong and courageous and powerful. And there was nothing wrong with it. I'd like to think that being a carpenter or a manual laborer back in those days, Jesus was probably quite strong physically. But it probably doesn't matter whether we picture him as muscular or thin. The more important thing, as he demonstrates time and time again, is that he was not afraid to righteously stand up to wrongdoers. He addressed sin directly. He called out sinners. He called out things that needed change and in our story today, he does so with some anger. Picture him with his whip. He was demanding an end to this greedy temple business. He knocked over tables. He did not back down from the leaders of the time. What right do you have, they demanded. If you do, not, if you do have any right, prove it, they said. We want a miracle. Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and I will bring it, raise it up in three days. They thought he was talking about the physical building. Of course, we know he was talking about his body, which these people would eventually destroy, they thought. But Jesus, by the power of his most holy father, would raise from the dead three days later after his crucifixion. Jesus' response here made perfect sense to the disciples after the resurrection. And these words, 
this three-day prediction that Jesus makes here in this story would be some of the strongest proof for his claims to be God because he fulfilled it so perfectly. So what does it all mean for us? Jesus making a whip and chasing out money changers does not really give us the right to be uncontrollably angry. It doesn't even give us the right to be a little bit angry over silly, petty personal offenses or minor inconveniences. But the story does remind us that we need to defend our faith and our God. We are called to stand up for what is right. We are called to make sure nothing gets in the way of worshiping God. And maybe, just maybe, the story should also remind us that Jesus is no wimp. He loved perfectly, to the point he was willing to get angry to do what was right. Yes, Jesus was humble, but he was not weak. He came as God's holy servant, the sacrificial lamb for us, the perfect, unblemished sacrificial lamb. But he was strong, strong enough to hold the weight of humanity's sin, including mine and yours, on his back as he carried that cross, our cross. He was courageous enough to live out a life plan that included a death he didn't deserve so we could have everlasting life. And Jesus was and is powerful. Yes, he was powerful enough to drive out the wrongdoing from the temple grounds over 2,000 years ago, but he's powerful enough still to drive out evil and darkness today. The world can be an unpredictable and even scary place for us, but Jesus has got this. Whatever awful thing goes on in our lives, whatever awful thing we see in the world, Jesus can handle it. Whatever is holding us back from worshiping, whatever is cluttering our way between us and God, like those merchants were getting in the way of the travelers at the temple, Jesus can take care of that too. We need only to call upon him. Jesus is love, and Jesus is no wimp. Now, I had my grandma read this. My grandma in West Virginia, many of you know, and she's had many health struggles lately. And she said there was just one thing. She called me and said, there's just one thing I think you should change. She said, in memory of the late Reverend Billy Graham, she said, I needed to end with Jesus loves you. And I can't do the point quite like he did it. <laughs> Jesus loves you. He loves each and every one of us. And thankfully, Jesus is no wimp.